Welcome everyone. Uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to have you here. Um, this, what the event we have today uh, is uh, uh, particular event on uh, uh, on a particularly uh, important uh, situation that uh, for human rights. I think in Turkey, but also at European and global level, of which we want to talk about about uh, uh, and uh, here I, I'm joined with really key speakers and so I think I'm, I'm very humbled actually to be this event I'm going to moderate I'm going to try not to talk too much I have a tendency to talk too much um, because I think you should hear from them uh, 10 years ago it would be on the 28th of December uh, 10 years ago uh, a group of people that was crossing the border from Iraq to Turkey, uh, family members, children um, were killed in uh, a bombing uh, um, ordered uh, and uh, um, performed by the uh, Turkish military. Uh, and uh, 10 years later, we are still asking the same questions So the day after who did it, why they did it, uh, what happened, uh, and uh, uh, who's responsible for this, and what is the punishment, <laughs> and what are the guarantees of non-repetition, et cetera, for something like this. I think these are tragic episodes. What is even more tragic is that 10 years ago, we are still at square one. We are still discussing about it. And very few people, I think, outside of Turkey, uh, know about this case and i think is the scope of this event is that we really uh do not forget we keep on the memory of this and we keep on the fight for accountability for this so today i am uh, very humbled to be joined by uh four very important speakers so mr ferrat enku who's former uh Member of Parliament uh, in the Great National Assembly of Turkey and also uh, a family member of the victim of this massacre. And uh, uh, lawyer uh, Karim Altiparmak, who is the lawyer of the victims and their families. And Mr. Roshan Pillet, who is the director of the ICJ Europe and Central Asia program. And Gabriela Citroni, who is a joint professor of international human rights law of the University of Milano Bicocca. She's a senior legal advisor for Trial International, who is one of the most renowned NGOs on the fight uh, for accountability for human rights violations. And she's a member of the Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. I'm Massimo Frigo. I'm senior legal advisor for the Europe and Central Asia Program of the ICJ and UN representative. Uh, and this event yeah, is uh, organized by the International Commission of Jurists, who has one of his main missions as the fight for accountability um, for crimes under international law, we have been uh, uh, behind uh, several instruments, including the International Convention on Enforced Disappearances, uh, the summary principles on uh, investigations for extrajudicial executions. So this for us is a core mission. This is really at the heart of what we want to do uh, and why we are doing this event. Um, I can see in the sense that uh, among the participants, there are also some delegates of the Geneva community and uh, uh, very welcome. Uh, today, what we're going to do is that we're going to hear presentations for the speakers. Uh, uh, you have a QA and a uh, option down below. You can uh, use it uh, to put your questions and uh, they will be asked uh, either in the passage from one presentation or the other or at the end. Um, if someone wants to deliver a particular statement, uh, please let us know in the function of the chat or by raising your hand. Uh, and uh, we can facilitate uh, that. As I said in the beginning, for those who weren't there, there is an interpretation possibility because uh, uh, Mr. Fratenko will deliver the presentation in Turkish, and I think it was Mr. Kramanti Parmak. Uh, you can choose English or Turkish, which is identified by the Korean option because Turkish is not available on Zoom. Uh, without further ado, uh, I really think there's, there's no more significant way to begin this uh, than by giving the floor to Mr. Ferhat Henko, who really could explain us really what this case is about, uh, what happened 
10 years ago and uh, what this meant really for him, for the family, for the community, and also for the human rights situation in Turkey. Uh, we are really grateful to have you, Mr. Renko, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you for having prepared this event. Uh, two weeks later, we will be commemorating the 10th anniversary of the Roboski event. What was experienced in Roboski 10 years ago. I would like to talk about this briefly. Because we live on the border, there is no border in the defined manner. We have very high mountains, and on top of that, one of those mountains, there is a a block, concrete block, and they call that the frontier. While they're drawing that frontier, they never ask people living there. There's some of the land of the people who live uh, in, in in on this side remained on the other hand, side, and of course, relatives are on the other side. So families were divided. So it is not a matter of frontier trade with another nation. There is no passport usually used when that trade is being carried out. We uh, either use mules or uh, we go on foot to uh, exchange goods. We also uh, intermarry with the people on the other side. Beyond all kinds of trade. This is a relationship of um, relatives among each other, kinship, a whole network of kinship uh, on the two sides. If something is um, inexpensive on the other side, uh, if you bring it into Turkey, you profit from this. And this way, both sides uh, profit from that trade. And this has been going on for years and decades. And therefore, the night of the 28th, December um, 2011, if we talk about that, well, people go during the day and come back at night. And the military knows this that they always cross the frontier. Uh, the drone, the unmanned aerial vehicle, followed people from the moment they left the village to the moment they were coming back. The, the people went to the frontier, but then did not cross the frontier and came back. They came back because uh, there was going to be a kind of raid and perhaps uh, there would be a, a firing. They had this sentiment. Despite this, this was the rumor, but uh, these people uh, said said they would go to the other side. That's the decision they made. They went to the other side. Uh, they bought uh, gasoline and cigarettes. And they brought it back. After having brought it back, because this is under the control of the military, and while these people were um, going, they, they left someone be behind to watch. 
and they realize that uh, the, there is no raid on the road. When they come to the frontier, they call their relatives, but now they realize there is a raid, and so uh, when they communicate with their relatives, they they talk, they ask they ask them whether they should go back or they should come back to the village or remain there in a certain sense stay put in if that is the case they would be a, if if they move there would be a problem so they stayed put there uh, they were in two groups they waited for half an hour just then Turkish F-16s, uh, warplanes, the first group, bombed a one of the groups and 19 people lost their lives. Four people were uh, alive despite the bombardment. Then a second bomb, three more died. One person remained alive when the second group was observed they looked for a place to shelter themselves uh, under rocks something like a cave and the third and fourth bombs were thrown on on top of them and 11 more people lost their lives. Overall, three people remained alive. One was heavily wounded. Of course, this bombardment was not something that was uh, that, 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 that occurred within two or three minutes. That night, the people who were on the watch let the village know by phone uh, that there was a bombardment and ask the villagers to establish communication with the military. And the families in Roboski uh, called the uh, commander of uh, the precinct. Uh, the, the commander said, don't worry. And 45 minutes later, another bombardment took place when 15, pe people, 15 more people lost their lives. The um, commander of the precinct of the gendarmerie uh, said that there was only firing on the group to scare them. But uh, it was reported to him that there were dead people and this was the answer that he gave. So for 45 minutes, these people were bombardment. They gave the information, the families that is gave the information, but nothing was done to intervene. Later, the um, uh, soldiers that um, made a kind of raid there went back home uh, in and, and met, the, met the families. Why are you bombarding uh, the uh, um, people who are coming back to their village, asked the uh, families. And they said, no, this was just to scare them. And rapidly they left the village. So this is the kind of night that they went through. This is a distance of one hour from the village where these people were bombarded. And when the villagers went, they saw the wounded, the uh, uh, bodies that were dismembered. They take them to hospitals. Unfortunately, technically, there was no intervention. Uh, the wounded were carried on the backs of their relatives. They brought them to where the vehicles could uh, re access them. And so this lasted for half an hour. And um, 
when ambulances were called, this is a military uh, region, we cannot come there, was the answer. They, they later come, but then when they come, the military uh, stop them. Uh, this is an operation zone, we cannot let you in. So even the vehicles uh, cannot reach them. So the mutilated bodies um, were collected, uh, the pieces were collected by the villagers. There were 13 people wounded, only one of them was saved. The others they lose their lives while being carried. One group remained under the rocks. Only in the morning, their bodies, their corpses were recovered uh, by digging. Um, you may have seen the pictures, the images. This is, of course, a terrible trauma. And this, of course, causes rage among the villagers. This is not any old massacre that was committed by mistake. This was totally consciously uh, decided. It was deliberate. These people are known to the military. This is not some uh, the, the first time uh, that this kind of thing. We always cross. I did this myself. You know, we cross the border. We go to uh, the uh, villages on the other side. We buy sugar or cigarettes or others. Uh, th this is not something that uh, only certain people practice. There are three or four villages in that region. Uh, the uh, overall population is around eight to ten, nine thousand. Sometimes, on the same um, occasion, a thousand people crossed the frontier, and when they met the military, the soldiers on their way back, uh, the uh, soldiers were offered packs of cigarettes or sugar. Yes, there were sometimes, you know, uh, a kind of. Uh, run and hide and uh, you know hide and seek sort of situation uh, between the soldiers and the uh, people who had crossed the border but everyone was very much used to this kind of trade um, uh, activity and there are you know paths that people use all the time the fact that these people were bombed is shows that this was a deliberate um, massacre. This was a message for some people. And trying to uh, sever the relations between the two sides. Of course, later, the families who confronted this massacre, who were the victims because they had lost their next of kin, of course, demanded that the perpetrators be found and punished. But unfortunately, the mentality that committed this massacre simply disregarded the demand for justice, uh, repressing the demands, uh, threatening people and um, try to shut them up through different manners. We could not even grieve for three days. We grieved. We mourned. Of course, tens of thousands of people came to share our grief. It is very clear that this is a very conscious and deliberate massacre on the part of the state. It's not, of course, acceptable that the representatives of the state come to share our grief. We only saw the bombing uh, agents of the state that night. So 
the uh, uh, coming of these people to um, wish our uh, uh, the family's condolence is not acceptable. So they provoked the period of consolence, condol condolence, sorry, that uh, we uh, traditionally had. And together with the expression of that rage, it's as if we, you know, they said we, you know, our families were lynching uh, the uh, district governor of the state. So they put all this in the file and they tried to make this a threat on the villagers. As if this were not sufficient, the families went to the um, district governor's office and said, there are perpetrators of this massacre. We are here to complain and ask that an investigation be um, opened up without listening to them. Rather than listening to them, they, they really repel them. Of course, Kerem Altaparmak will be talking about this uh, the legal aspect is so I, I'm only taking up the political and uh, aspect and the sentimental aspect from the point of view of the uh, family um, family's reactions. Turning this into a kind of political movement, we uh, went to the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, starting with the AKP, all parties. Although we knew that the AKP was responsible in this massacre, we really displayed our best intentions. We said, well, you know, we should, we should really look into the people responsible for this massacre. We even talked with the MHP. In this struggle for justice, we uh, really expressed this um, in the in Parliament. There was the Peace and Democracy Party, which which is uh, of the same family of parties as the HDP. Um, all kinds of investigation commissions uh, were demanded, etc. One investigation commission was established. They came and listened to the families. But in the end, this commission said this was a grave error. This was a deliberate massacre. 34 people had lost their lives. Since that time, up until today, not one person has been prosecuted for this. Not even one person was um, expelled from office or um, simply brought aside so that they, they could be investigated. This massacre, this repression, uh, I received death threats again and again from the military. I received death threats from the bureaucrats there. If you don't really um, let go of this whole affair, we will show you what will happen. So 34 people lost their lives, and they said that this was a grave error. Five uh, deputies, uh, members of parliament, one CHP, one HDP, one 
MHP and five AKP deputies, eight people in all. There was an opinion of dissent on the part of the CHP and HDP deputies, but uh, with the votes of the uh, AKP majority, this was said to be a grave error. Many human rights defenders uh, came in. Bu, bu katliamı e, sorunların açığa çıkarılmasını talep eden how this massacre came about and they demanded that the perpetrators be penalized and we went to the Grand National Assembly many times over and tried to establish contact with various uh, political parties however in the end we are almost um, commemorating the 10th anniversary, uh, anniversary of this massacre and nothing happened. No remedy for the traumatized families. No remedy whatsoever. They, um, the anger and the hurt deepened and um, the political um, will is uh, blindsided and uh, there are no celebrations taking place anymore in those villages. We used to uh, celebrate and um, contact um, the people that uh, live over the border and we had many weddings and this is a village mi village mind you where weddings and celebrations and different kinds of festi festivities were taking place every other day very frequently so lots of joy and enjoyment but this has all changed and this is uh, also very traumatizing for the entire territory and the country. Unfortunately, this massacre happened and um, the ones that um, perpetrated this massacre tried to uh, bury this massacre. They tried to present what happened in a different light, also towards the international arena. This is the current situation. This is what we are facing. The latest uh, with Roborski is the following, uh, and uh, this uh, will present the end of my uh, speech here. After the Roborski massacre happened, Uh, this event uh, was um, taken up in light of the anti-terror uh, law 100 plus 23 and um, compensation uh, was issued, but this is considered uh, in our eyes as blood money. We didn't ask or we didn't demand to be compensated in the material uh, sense or in any other way. This is a matter of international human rights. And we wanted to claim our rights that um, we are entitled to claim uh, pertaining to international covenants and conventions and um, our demand, this very demand of ours could only be actualized if the perpetrators were penalized, identified and brought to justice. This is not any other massacre uh, where just a few people lost their lives. This is a mass uh, hyphen ecker. So a massive uh, event and those that perpetrated this massacre uh, is also a reflection of a very deep-rooted uh, problem. We wanted this problem to be uh, solved because we have been killed 
in this territory, in this country, for much longer than 10 years, we step on mines, on landmines. Uh, our language is uh, prohibited. We are not allowed to speak our own mother tongue. We are discriminated against, or we have been discriminated against for much, much longer than 10 years. And we said, we wanted to make a statement and uh, said, never again, never again. because we didn't want anybody else to suffer what we have suffered because of this and because of many other uh, events. This geography, this territory, this country should never be the stage for similar massacres anymore. No discrimination anymore because of your ethnic background and other uh, reasons and backgrounds. This was our demand, but at the end of the day, zero on the table and Keram will uh, elaborate on this i'm sure many families uh, currently are being discriminated against because of the um, current uh, anti-terror uh, law in place and um, families have been materially compensated I, i'm not sure what uh, the amount they have been compensated with uh, is in dollars right now because the currency's exchange rate is uh, over the charts, but uh, this is the current situation right now. And may I say, they are so assured of themselves because they know they will not be brought in front of a judge. They will not be brought to the courthouse. They know that. This is a very explicit uh, violation of the right to life. And even the European Court of, uh, of Human Rights has uh, considered our application inadmissible. Uh, this is unacceptable. And our only hope that remains is the following. If uh, the ruling government were to change, if the executive powers were to change one day in Turkey, there might be a slight grain of hope for us in the hopes that this dossier, this file, this case of ours might be put on the, on the agenda once again. Uh, I cannot think of any other way out uh, anymore. This is our only hope um, left because everybody is uh, is blindfolded. They don't see, they don't want to hear, and they don't want to speak about this. Amongst the ones that lost their lives, there were children, people that went to school, that held hopes and had the dreams concerning their future. But unfortunately, these people's dreams and hopes were shattered literally by those bombs that were thrown. This is unfortunately the situation that we're facing. And of course, you get emotional when you talk about these things because you are extremely going back to those days when this happened, but you have to remain calm and um, you have to look for other remedies. And um, mind you, um, the pressure is still ongoing. And this makes you angry. This makes you very upset. And I'm not sure. I think my emotionality right now is a little bit reflected in my voice. Um, uh, apologies for that. If I couldn't um, keep a calm and cool head. But let me come to the end of this round. And then if you should have any, any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you very much. I I found that it was mostly dignified, uh, absolutely not uh, uh, emotional. Uh, uh, I, I think is the minimum in a situation of this gravity. Uh, and uh, it really resonates with me, uh, the never again, the never again. Instance, uh, sometimes people have a tendency to think this is someone else's problem, this is someone else's massacre, this is someone else's situation, it's awful, but the reality is that something like this, when it stays in impunity, 
is a tragedy for the victim, is a tragedy for the family, but it's a tragedy for everyone because it's a cancer that erodes the institutions, that erodes the capacity of a state to respect the human rights of all of its citizens. So I think it's extremely important that memory and state and the fight against impunity remains. So I thank you very much, Ferratenko, uh, for your testimony. Uh, I now give the floor to Karen Maltiparmak, who's the lawyer of uh, um, the victims and the members of their families. Uh, be because I think it's very important when we know now the story and the tragedy of the Roboshki massacre, the struggle uh, for impunity, but there is, the struggle for impunity is also a legal battle. And uh, I think it's important to hear what, the, how heavy it is to actually bring this battle up to courts in a country like Turkey, but also in a general situation where the situation, where, where the procedures are, uh, are almost like a Sisyphus uh, fatigue. Uh, so, Karen, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm not going to take you too much time, otherwise we're going to run over time. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen Mr. Uh, and thank you, ICJ, for organizing this event, uh, because impunity problems are always re directly related to freedom of expression issues. And I think Farad Enju is an excellent example for this. Uh, he also is uh, known in international human rights community by his name, apart from his membership to, to the family, because there is a case pending before the European Court of Human Rights called Ferhat Enju and others versus Turkey. Ferhat became an MP at the parliament, but his immunity was lifted and he was punished for voicing uh, the sorrow of uh, the family, uh, for criticizing the government, for criticizing the authorities to hide the truth. So uh, uh, making the uh, voice of families and the victims of this a tragic event to be heard by international community is quite important. So uh, I think uh, this event, uh, I hope that it will be uh, watched by many others uh, later, uh, will, might be the first uh, where uh, this different angles of the story uh, could be told. So uh, uh, I, I think that this is uh, a necessary reminder uh, about the freedom of expression uh, problem connected uh, to the impunity. And impunity in Turkey is not a new thing. Uh, Roboski was not the first event. Uh, those who are uh, monitoring Turkey uh, closely will know that Turkey's cases shape the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights under Article 2 and 3 uh, because of a number of impunity cases. And unfortunately, even getting judgments from the European Court of Human Rights uh, has not helped the victims a lot because no one, almost no one uh, who, who was responsible in those cases uh, have ever been uh, prosecuted in Turkey. But what makes uh, Roboski uh, different than uh, the cases of 1990s is uh, at that turn, uh, there was a full denial by the Turkish government about the e event, about responsibility, about accountability. But the Roboski took place not in 1990s, but at the beginning of uh, 2011, uh, to, uh, at the end of 2011. And uh, unlike 1990s, the strategy of impunity was changed in, in Turkey. Uh, rather than full denial, the abuse of procedural rules, criminal law uh, took place, uh, the full denial uh, strategy. And Roboski uh, in uh, every sense uh, may be the best example for this new strategy. Uh, let me remind some uh, important point about uh, the uh, background of the case, uh, Ferhat already said that, but I will uh, present it uh, as a background for legal case. Uh, there was no military activity as at the border when the 
incident took place. This is very critical because at uh, different times, uh, Turkish border uh, witnessed uh, heavy clashes between uh, PKK and the Turkish military forces. But at the uh, time of this event, there was no clash between uh, the Turkish military and PKK. That's why, as Ferhat already said, there was a routine uh, trade uh, at the border uh, from the village to Iraq and Iraq to, uh, to the village. Diesel, sugar, rice, and tea uh, from uh, vehicles coming from Zaho and taken uh, by mules uh, to the Turkish border. So uh, this is the first thing. Second thing is uh, this uh, trade routine was very well known by the military forces. Not only uh, those uh, that organized the uh, military operation, but also uh, by the military units very close to the village. Farad and his family kindly uh, hosted me in the village, and I, I was able to see how close was the military unit to the village. So they knew that those people were trading to Iraq. And uh, not, not a uh, very rare uh, fashion, it was uh, an occasional uh, trade between Iraq and Turkey. And even at that day, uh, there were two uh, more Informa information needs to be uh, told. The first thing is uh, the drones uh, monitored the border uh, about seven, eight hours. So they were able to see if there was really a military uh, terrorist attack from the Iraq. Uh, this 13, eight people group of uh, uh, terrorists holding heavy weapons cannot be noticed by uh, drones uh, monitoring the uh, area for uh, seven, eight hours. And uh, at that, at the very same day, there was another uh, operation which was called Star 2011 Ambush Listening Operation. Uh, under this operation, two uh, military units uh, were uh, conducting uh, uh, operations uh, uh, at the border, and they were very closely monitoring the uh, movements uh, at the border. So there is no explanation how all this uh, information was missed uh, by the uh, authorities. And uh, after the uh, operation, and when uh, four uh, F-16 bombardment uh, planes bombed uh, two groups of people. Uh, as already stated by Ferhat, nobody uh, passed the border to collect the uh, victims and this resulted for uh, with further casualties. Uh, and this point uh, has never been investigated by the authorities either, not just uh, the military operation, but uh, later the failure to provide uh, humanitarian aid to, to the region. Uh, this uh, hasn't uh, been uh, investigated. Uh, there were three uh, legal investigations uh, which can be framed in this procedural abuse of rules. Uh, the first one was an administrative investigation conducted by the inspection office of the Ministry of Interior. The second one is the Parliamentary Inquiry Commission, which already stated by uh, Ferhat. And the final one is a criminal uh, investigation. And uh, none of them produced a real result. Uh, the statement made by the general staff uh, at, that, uh, at, at that morning, the following morning on the 29th of December, 2011, right after the incident, was later expanded and repeated in all investigations, uh, all three investigations, and led to, uh, to the closure uh, of the criminal investigation. It was taken uh, as the fact, this statement that was made just a couple of hours after the incident was taken as the truth, and uh, it wasn't questioned by uh, authorities later. Uh, administrative investigation was the most important one because uh, this 
uh, two investigators appointed by the Ministry of Interior uh, determined that uh, an investigation should be opened. They stated that uh, a further investigation uh, need to be conducted by uh, the authorities uh, due to, to serious uh, incomplete and erroneous matters in many subjects in the report. An administrative uh, investigation uh, was not opened against those responsible despite uh, the presence of uh, this report. Uh, and no one uh, was sanctioned administratively uh, following this uh, report uh, and against uh, the recommendation made under this report. Uh, the Parliamentary Assembly Commission report uh, concluded that no evidence could be obtained as to the fact that the incident was deliberate uh, in the investigations and inquiries made. They concluded that it was a mistake as uh, noted by uh, Ferhat. And a criminal investigation, it was uh, initiated by civil authorities at the beginning, but uh, the Arbaca Public Prosecutor's Office decided not to prosecute and sent the file to the General Staff Military Prosecutor's Office, as uh, you might imagine. And uh, there were some names, some high level uh, military officers, but none of those names were the ones who decided to conduct a direct air campaign. So we still don't know who decided and ordered uh, this uh, cross-border military operation. And it's unclear why the, these people were chosen as suspects, but not others, especially those who ordered the operation. Uh, from the first moment of the investigation, the possibility that the crime could have been committed intentionally was not considered. They said that, okay, this was a fault. This was a mistake. There was no intention from the very beginning. So the uh, investigation was conducted according to this scenario. And uh, the 16 page non-prosecution decision uh, uh, had very insufficient reasoning in it, limiting to a formal conclusion in accordance with Article 30 of the Turkish Penal Code, that the person who is inevitably mistaken about the factual qualifications of an offense, which abolishes the criminal libel, liability may take uh, advantage of it, this mistake and should not be punished. Because they thought that, uh, as I already stated, uh, drones monitored the region for eight hours, they have all information about the routine trade uh, at the border and close military units knew that villagers passed the uh, border and they were expected to come back with, with the goods, but still uh, the mil military prosecutor concluded that there was a mistake uh, by making this operation. And this mistake, according to, to a non-prosecution decision, was based on information uh, brought by um, uh, military units about the existence of some terrorist uh, groups uh, in the region. Uh, and the family uh, and the relatives of the victims and their law lawyers did not have the opportunity to see the file while the investigation was ongoing uh, as a confidentiality order was placed on the file at that time. And uh, the prosecution office did not examine the crime scene, uh, the suspect's statements, the witness statements, did not question the lack of information exchanged between the local military units and the general staff uh, in Ankara. And then uh, lawyers of the uh, families challenged against this decision before the Air Force Command Military Court. And this decision, did not address any of the deficiencies uh, in the prosecution's decision and accepted non-prosecution uh, decision. And uh, the whole period for investigation without collecting any evidence uh, continued for two years and seven months and concluded no result. Then uh, the families applied to the uh, constitutional court uh, their lawyers made a mistake at that stage. Uh, 
but I think we, we can discuss whether this mistake should be that important. Uh, he made the application on the day uh, required by the uh, law. However, the Constitutional Court decided to request some documents from the applicants. Uh, the lawyer sent those documents at the 17th day, but the uh, uh, Constitutional Court gave 15 days uh, for, uh, for those documents to be sent. Uh, two days later, he sent a medical report showing an excuse uh, for uh, sending the uh, document uh, late. By the way, not all those documents are very important. For instance, uh, the Constitutional Court asked for the certificated and approved uh, court decision for some applicants because some of them uh, did not uh, have uh, authorization for their lawyers. This can be understood. But for some others, the only missing document was uh, an approved official judgment of the uh, Air Force Command Military Court. And this is available digitally under Turkish uh, digital court system. So without it, you can decide and examine uh, the application. However, uh, about a year and after, a, a year and a half after, the Constitutional Court dismissed the application without entering uh, into the merits nor the uh, admissibility stage for a formality, holding that certain documents were submitted without the provided deadline. So with for, for these two days, uh, the whole application about the ma massacre uh, was rejected uh, by the Constitutional Court. I'm not going into details because we don't have time, but I wrote an article on this uh, so I can share uh, with you, with those who want. Uh, this was the very first decision denying an application in this way by the Constitutional Court. So it was definitely not foreseeable for the applicants and their lawyers. Yes, the lawyer made a mistake, but uh, even for this mistake, we can easily uh, say that uh, it was not foreseeable, uh, but the uh, decision was rejected. Then I was the lawyer uh, uh, bringing uh, this case to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, we uh, put all those arguments to the European uh, Court of Human Rights, but with a committee decision, uh, the European Court stated that uh, local remedies uh, had not been uh, exhausted due to uh, failure of the lawyers uh, to present the documents on time. And uh, after then, we tried to revive the case. Uh, now, I, I, will give, I will give a brief information about this. Uh, there was a coup cool attempt, as you know, uh, uh, against state institutions that took place on 15 July 2016. And uh, after this uh, event, 4,296 judges and prosecutors were dismissed by uh, state of emergency decrees. Uh, after the coup attempt, the then Ministry of Ener Energy and uh, National uh, Sources, and also uh, the family member of the president, Berat al Bayrak, in a television program broadcasted on 26 July 2016 stated that this structure, he meant uh, FETÖPDE, that is called by the Turkish government and uh, called as a terrorist organization, was responsible for the bombardment of villagers in Uludere, uh, Roboski. And uh, he said that uh, the incident will be rain investigated. He was so sure that uh, the responsible people were still in power. And there was also uh, supporting evidence uh, to this claim because the prosecutor who held the decision not to prosecute uh, the event, uh, Ali Mujdat Eski, was detained under the investigation army structure of FETA. And then two judges in the military court that had approved the non-prosecution decision in 
Roboski case were also charged as FETA members. Uh, one of them uh, is still on the run and the other one uh, dismissed from military and the judiciary. The only person who remained in power uh, is Oz Pirtash, and he voted for the prosecution of the Roboski massacre. Uh, we applied again to the uh, public prosecutor office at Diyarbakir claiming that this is a new evidence which should revive uh, the investigation because the highest level of uh, politician uh, in Turkey claims that this incident was committed by some illegal people uh, in the state, plus those who uh, acquitted those responsible people were also dismissed due to their links to this organization. It means that this is a new evidence which requires authorities to initiate an new investigation. Another year and a half passed before Shirnak Public Prosecutor Office to examine this claim. And uh, in a two page decision without discussing all those allegations, Shirnak Public Prosecutor uh, decided not to prosecute once again. And we challenged against this decision against Shirnak Criminal Peace Judgeship. And we claim that this new evidence uh, should revive uh, the uh, investigation. And we relied on uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, especially Bracknell versus United Kingdom uh, judgment where uh, the court developed this uh, new evidence that revives uh, the duty to investigate uh, Article 2 cases. But this was uh, uh, rejected as well. And against this final decision, we apply to the Constitutional Court. And uh, this uh, second Constitutional Court application is still pending uh, before the court. And in the meantime, while uh, the, the fight against impunity was continuing, a lot of members of the family, including Ferhat, uh, have been prosecuted by Turkish authorities for defaming the state, defaming the president, uh, defaming the authorities, making terrorist propaganda, and in some cases supporting, uh, aiding and abating uh, terrorist organizations. So uh, yes, a, a kind of uh, justice is working, but always uh, against the uh, victims, unfortunately. But I see this as a part of this strategy. Uh, this cannot be uh, divorced from each other. Uh, Non-prosecution uh, on the one side, and prosecution of the victims uh, on the other side. Uh, as Ferhat, I can uh, answer questions if, I, if there are any uh, after uh, other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karim. Uh, and thank you very much for explaining how, yeah, this is the first task of going against uh, the windmills. Uh, basically, he's trying to get justice in Turkey. And that, but there is a light motive we hear about this. this is, the, the victims were targeted uh, and then uh, impunity was achieved by saying, oh, but we thought they were terrorists. Uh, and now the victims mm -hmm. look for justice and again, terrorism is used. It's kind of this overall concept used to uh, perpetrate impunity and control in Turkish society. So uh, for to address these issues is what uh, the impact that actually counterterrorism and terrorism has had in Turkey for the fight against impunity and for the respect of human rights in Turkey. We have uh, Russian PD, the director of the European and Central Asia program with the SJ. Russian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Massimo, um, and thank you to the uh, previous speakers and um and uh to mr uh and cool and, and and to the other relatives and the community affected by this my my condolences and uh on the no doubt the continuing uh impact of of these killings um so massimo i'm not sure i'll manage to address all of the issues that you've raised but what i want to do is to um is to start the conversation, which I think Gabriella will continue about how international law applies to this. And I want to do that in particular uh, in relation to the fact of um, that, that this was a counterterrorism operation 
and and that the the the, the whole thing was um was placed in this um context of exceptionalism of of, of the need to address terrorism um and it's very significant that that was the case, I think, both to the killings and to the aftermath and everything to do with the, the investigation. Um, and obviously, it is not only in Turkey, but um, but 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 globally, uh, we it's it's a it's an obvious statement um, that uh, where counterterrorism is invoked, and uh, the protection of, of human rights is often weakened both in terms of the legal protection and in practice uh, in the uh, and in the investigation and redress and remedies that are more difficult to obtain and that's even more so when we're speaking of violations of the rights of groups communities that are discriminated against uh, or, or stigmatized and, and that has also been a factor here and this general trend in many countries including in in turkey but also elsewhere has been highlighted uh, by many authorities by successive un special Rapport rapporteurs on counterterrorism, as well as by ngos like the international commission for us um, and and this case is really a stark illustration of it um, I think it's also striking that this counterterrorism operation apparently took place on the basis of intelligence information um, that transpired to be to be incorrect, entirely incorrect. That intelligence was was relied on, apparently with very little scrutiny or, or attention to the detail and without any attempt also to apply the criminal justice process to address any uh, concerns of, uh, of terrorist crime. Um, there was no attempt to arrest anyone. Um, there was no attempt to take any other procedure or investigative steps. So the reliance on intelligence and on military means to, to address um, alleged concerns of terrorist activity um, meant that there were very few, if, if any at all, um, checks on the on the use or constraints on the on the use of legal lethal force um, in this this case, and the indeed the decision making process in terms of the the military counterterrorism operation was um, was 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 set out in the statement of the Turkish general staff that was made uh, shortly after the massacre, where it, it seemed to be quite a perfunctory process. It was simply said that it was known that there were um, terrorist organizations active in the area um, and uh, there was some drone information and that then uh, the area concerned was a route often used by terrorists um, at, at this particular time of, of night. Um, and then it said there was a discussion that an Air Force operation should be launched. Um, so even leaving aside the possibility that the killings were deliberate um, at minimum an assumption was made about the nature of the group crossing the border that was incorrect and apparently no checks or certainly no effective checks were applied to prevent the use of, of lethal force um, proceeding on that assumption so how does international human rights law apply to these kind of counterterrorism operations well on international law on the right to life um, it's very clear that counterterrorism operations require stringent safeguards all the way through the operation to limit the use of lethal force to cases of absolute necessity. And anything less than this will amount to a violation of, of the obligation by the, the state uh, as, as, as set out in, in Article 6 of the International Covenant um, uh, on, on Civil and Political Rights, uh, the right to life as set out in that article. Um, as well as the rights to life um, set out in Article 2 of the, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and in counterterrorism operations, as in other law enforcement operations, any use of lethal force can only be justified to prevent an imminent threat to life or, or, or serious injury, as the, the Human Rights Committee um, has, has, the UN Human Rights Committee has said. Um, the use of force must be in accordance with law, it must be used only exceptionally and as a last resort. And the UN Human Rights Committee has made clear that, um, in its general comment on the right to life, that what this means is that there must be procedures to ensure 
that law enforcement actions minimize the risk to life, that force um, and firearms are used only where absolutely necessary, where other means have been exhausted first, and where they're used in a way that's, that's proportionate. And this is also the standard applied, um, for example, in the UN basic principles on the use of firearms by law enforcement officials, again, saying that law enforcement officials must first of all apply non-violent means then only then resort to force and even then must use force um, in a way that shows restraint and that minimizes the risk to to life so all of these obligations also apply in counterterrorism operations um, notwithstanding the the rhetoric and the narrative of of exceptionalism that is that is often used by governments in relation to those those operations um, indeed a lot of the most important international human rights jurisprudence on the obligations of states in, re, in regard to the use of le le lethal force concerns counterterrorism operations um, and what this case law has emphasized is that the whole planning of a, of a counterterrorism operation, the control of it at all different levels must be done in a way that minimizes the, the risk to life. Um, just to take some examples of cases that I think perhaps provide um, uh, good points of comparison for this, um, for this, the, for the Roboski uh, case, the um, famous case before the European Court of Human Rights of McCann versus the United Kingdom. Is, is illustrative and that concerned three uh, suspected terrorists who were shot dead by the United Kingdom security forces uh, on the island of Gibraltar. And they were shot in the mistaken belief, and I think it was a genuinely mistaken belief, um, that they were on the point of detonating a remote controlled bomb. Now in this case, in, in the McCann case, um, the, uh, the government was, in a, in a better position than, than in the Roboski case, because they, they, the, the individuals who were killed in, 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 in the McCann case, in fact, were members of a terrorist organization and were planning a terrorist operation, but they were not doing so on that particular day. Um, and the court found that um, the, the, the killings had violated the right to life. Um, they, the court found that it, in principle, the use of lethal force on the basis of an honest um, mistake, uh, an honest but mistaken belief that there was an imminent threat to life. This could in some cases be justified. It could in principle be justified, but in this case it wasn't. And that was because there was a lack of safeguards uh, throughout the, the decision-making process in the, the operation. And there were mistakes made at different parts of the stages of the planning and control of the operation. And the court looked um, at the whole background. They looked at whether the law enforcement officials had been properly trained to use adequate restraint. They looked at how things had been planned and different levels of the command had made efforts or not to minimize the risk to, to life. And they asked questions about why there had been no attempt to arrest the suspects before uh, lethal force was used. Um, and taking all this together on the facts of that case, they found that the use of force um, had not been absolutely necessary, that uh, incorrect assumptions had been made, that there was uh, insufficient um, uh, uh, credit given to the possibility of those assumptions being wrong, um, and that the uh, training uh, provided to the officers on the ground was perhaps not sufficient. So this is instructive in relation to the, the, what happened with the operation in, in Robotsky, where certainly um, I think there, you know, those uh, that 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 care in the planning of the operation and the uh, the the, um, the making of of, of, of uh, entirely uh, incorrect assumptions uh, also applies. Um, a further case that I think maybe uh, would, is, is is relevant is. Um, uh, the case of uh, Takieva versus Russia. This again is another case before the European Court of Human Rights, and it concerns the, um, the the siege by a terrorist group of the the school at Beslan, which many people may know about. Um, 
which was a real uh, terrorist situation and a real uh, um, uh, case in which there was real threat to life that the security forces were trying to counter. But in that case, the the um, the security forces has had used highly indiscriminate force and weapons that resulted in the deaths of many hostages. And this is also very relevant to Robuski because of the, the scale and the indiscriminate nature of the, the force used in, in those killings. And in the Takieva case, the court found that there was a violation of the right to life because the massive use of indiscriminate weapons could not be uh, considered compatible with the standard of care needed. Um, in minimizing uh, the use of force. The use of explosive indiscriminate weapons carried such risk for human life that it could not, in this case, be regarded as absolutely necessary. And then again, the standard of absolute necessity has to be met. Um, and it's very difficult, I would say, to see how that standard has been met in, in Robotsky in relation to those killings. Um, given that the information on which uh, the uh, officials acted was so much more mistaken even than in the two cases I cited and that the victims were not in any way uh, involved in terrorist activity. Um, just to, I will conclude shortly, but just to, to say um, in, in terms of also how international standards apply that there, there was um, Quite shortly after the, the, the massacre in Robotsky, there was a report um, issued by uh, Christoph Heinz, the then Special Rapporteur in Extrajudicial Executions. And he found, this was a report on, on, on Turkey, on many different issues in Turkey, but he addressed um, issues of, of counterterrorism operations, um, amongst others. Um, and he found problems with the Turkish law, as well as the practice of, of counterterrorism operations. Uh, around the time of, of Robotsky. Um, and he found that the, uh, the legal framework for counterterrorism operations contained serious ambiguities that, it, for example, it failed to stipulate that the use of lethal force should be a last resort uh, to protect life, uh, and that the authorities um, uh, were using firearms um, directly and unhesitatingly, he said, in cases uh, where there are allegations of terrorist activity. Um, and in that regard, he raised concerns about a number of cases where civilians had been mistakenly targeted in counterterrorism, um, including uh, the Robotsky case. Um, so I, I will leave it at that. And I, of course, there are, and um, this is only one aspect of the international law framework. Also, we have to think of the, the obligations to provide medical assistance, which has been mentioned that were, uh, that were apparently um, entirely disregarded in this case, and the very important uh, framework around the uh, investigation uh, and accountability in the case, which I, I hope uh, Gabriella will, will, will address more. But um, just to conclude that um, clearly applying these general principles of international human rights law, that there, there, there are uh, enormous problems with, um, with, with the operation uh, in, this, in this case uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, aren't in any way um, uh, uh, improved by, um, by the fact that it, it happened in the framework of, of, of counterterrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, and it gives an idea also of what are the obligations that Turkey actually was supposed to respect, it is still supposed to respect. Uh, without further ado, because we are getting way over time and uh, we're probably going to linger about 10 minutes more, and thank you for the public to uh, remain with us, uh, I will give the floor to Gabriela Citroni to really complete a bit the framework to let us understand what are really uh, uh, in addition to the obligations also under the UN treaties and etc that uh, uh, Turkey has to respect and what are some examples of the fight against the brute that maybe can inspire to get some accountability. Gabriela, the floor is yours and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much uh, Massimo and thank you uh, to all the previous speakers. Uh, I, indeed first I, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, from the deep of my, of my heart, uh, Mr. Enjo, for, for sharing with us. I understand this is difficult and therefore I, I really would like to share my sympathy and express all my solidarity uh, in the face of, uh, of such horrific events uh, and such a difficult struggle. 
and and similarly, I would like to express my ad admiration and solidarity to Mr. Altiparma, because struggling on a case like this is, is not an easy task, as he eloquently shared with us. And of course, I would like to share Massimo and ICJ in general, uh, not only for inviting me, but for organizing this event. Because I do think, and I, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Aldi Permark, uh, impunity begins uh, or is very much uh, helped by silence. Uh, if we allow indifference uh, on these kind of events, uh, we are somehow enabling impunity and uh, uh, making the struggle for justice further uh, complicated. So keeping up, up or speaking of these events, uh, making this known and, and creating the opportunity for sharing uh, on these kind of events and maybe experiences uh, or lessons learned uh, also from other places is extremely important uh, and is also a way that contributes and goes in the direction of what was expressed before, never again. If we do not remember what happened, if we do not speak about what happened, this might happen again and again. So I, I really would like to congratulate uh, uh, on, on this initiative. Unfortunately, Roboski, um, maybe a, a textbook case for what impunity is about. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, listening to you, I could tick the box uh, on all the tools uh, for uh, guaranteeing impunity. A and this is also important to share. Um, the good news in the face of so many bad news uh, is that international law, um, as was in already somehow shared, offers some answers to all these, uh, to all these uh, obstacles. Um, when it comes to impunity in particular, because Rassin shared with us what should have been done, uh, although we are in, in counter-terrorism, uh, there are certain standards uh, that we should abide by. Uh, but after it happens, uh, what are the obligations of the state? Uh, what has to be done to address this? And uh, I think a text uh, that if we take literally, we can tick the box, uh, uh, are the updated principles uh, for the protection and promotion of human rights uh, through action to combat impunity. Um, and, and I think that particular instrument uh, is so very relevant in this case because it also answers what Mr. Altiparmak uh, evidenced. The fact that sometimes uh, legal rules, procedural tricks, procedural um, rules are used to favor impunity. And that instrument gives us some answers and some standards we should abide by to actually avoid this kind of uh, abuse of the law and abuse of the rules. I would really want to take one minute to go back and to read what the definition of impunity is in those principles. Because if we read that definition, we understand how the case of Roboski massacre is literally the image of what impunity is about. Impunity means the impossibility, the jure or de facto, of bringing the perpetrators of violations to account, whether in criminal, civil, administrative, or disciplinary proceedings. And here we've heard that we have them all on top parliamentary as well. Um, since they are not subject to an inquiry that might lead them to being accused, arrested, tried, and if found guilty, sentenced to appropriate penalties and to making reparations to their victims. And I would underline also this part. It's not a coincidence that it says making reparations and not paying compensation. Reparations, when it comes to this kind of gross human rights violation, is much more than money. As Mr. Andrew explained so eloquently, uh, providing pure compensation is actually re-traumatizing in the face of this kind of events. It's perceived as bloody money. It's perceived as something that is not encompassing the gravity of the harm at stake. And here, I would say that both elements uh, of what impunity is made about, lack of justice in terms of bringing to account those responsible, and lack of reparations in this integral sense of the word are unfortunately met. 
if we read those principles, they also spell out what would actually be the obligations of the states in the face of this kind of gross human rights violations. And indeed, there is a reference to investigation and not whatever kind of investigation, investigation that meets certain standards. And from what we've learned and what we've heard, uh, I would say that here, um, it's difficult to see them complying those standards, uh, neither were investigations prompt or <coughs> thorough. Uh, with regard to independence, I'll come back to this in a minute, uh, let aside impartial. Mm, take measures to hold accountable those uh, involved. As we've heard, apparently there is no single person who has been prosecuted uh, apart from the victims or the lawyers uh, who has been prosecuted or held accountable for these events. Providing reparation in this integral sense and upholding the inalienable right to know the truth. And I would say this is important because on this massacre, we know the events, unfortunately. But the truth is much more than that, is really knowing who was there, who has done this, where the order came from. And I would like to emphasize that this right is so important because it is not only individual, if we please, it is not only with the relatives uh, themselves uh, who have been hit by this huge tragedy, but it is with society at large. The society in Turkey, but society, I would say globally, uh, it is unacceptable in the face of this kind of events uh, that we don't know 10 years later what has happened, the circumstances in the, um, the progress of the investigations. And I would like to emphasize that all these obligations uh, are instrumental and crucial to actually prevent reoccurrence. Because when we discuss about struggling against impunity, there is often um, what I see as a misconception that is very much about looking into the past and addressing the past. And indeed it is, but it is crucial to actually look also to the future. If we don't look into the past and we don't address the past, this may happen again. And in fact, this is part of general obligation that is also preventing uh, reoccurrence. If we read those principles, uh, and uh, we don't have time, but I really would invite you to, to compare the facts that we listen to, to the principles in there, and you will see that it's literally a tick the box exercise. We would find that, for instance, uh, there are certain rules that states should abide by when it comes to, <clears throat> sorry, superior responsibility. Uh, principle 29 here is grossly violated because there are certain certain restrictions on military jurisdictions. So for, of course, uh, when we are facing alleged human rights violations, uh, uh, it's ordinary courts that should be um, competent and not the military uh, jurisdiction and military tribunal because of lack of independence uh, and uh, impartiality. Um, <coughs> sorry, all the procedural rules uh, and uh, the use uh, or abuse of those procedural rules, uh, we do find them um, somehow jeopardized uh, by what we've heard uh, here. There is an additional instrument uh, in international law, uh, again, soft law, but nonetheless, somehow crystallizing uh, uh, customary rules, uh, which seems to me to have been violated as well. Uh, that is the Minnesota Protocol on Effective uh, Prevention and Investigation of Potentially Unlawful Death. Um, in its latest revised version of 2016, I would actually say that uh, uh, when we listen that, uh, to the fact that there has not been any uh, investigation or crime scene investigation, witnesses have not been heard, they have not been allowed to uh, have access to files of the investigation or to actually actively participate and contribute to the investigation. All those aspects uh, that might seem procedural are actually crucial to ensuring the proper respect uh, uh, of these international standards. Um, one, one thing I would like to mention here um, is that indeed there is also relevant case law. As, as Racine uh, mentioned earlier, uh, there is a lot also from the European Court of Human Rights uh, 
which unfortunately in this case doesn't seem to have been the most open and progressive partner in the struggle uh, for, for justice, which is unfortunate because in the past uh, there have been relevant judgments. Uh, and I think in particular of, of one delivered in 2013 against Turkey, um, and I apologize for the pronunciation, the case Benzer and, and others uh, uh, against Turkey, which resounds, resonates very much with this case, uh, 34 victims, uh, aerial bombings of two villages. In that case, uh, it must be said, the European Court of Human Rights uh, found violations both for the kind of operations carried out, but also for the lack of proper investigation, prosecution, and reparation to victims. It is unfortunate, therefore, that in this case, they somehow departed from, from these precedents. Uh, but that's why I would like to share with you um, something that might sound far away, uh, but unfortunately, I do think it's, it's closer um, than, we, than we might think. Um, today, while we speak precisely, uh, the 13th of December is another anniversary. Um, it's 23 years, precisely 23 years, uh, where in another continent, uh, a massacre very similar, it will sound, uh, it will resonate with you, was committed. I'm speaking about a massacre committed in, in Colombia in a village called Santo Domingo. So on the 13th of December, 1998, uh, in Santo Domingo, precisely in a situation very similar to what you have been uh, telling us, uh, the Colombian army um, bombarded the village. And this resulted in the death of 17 people, including six children. And in 27, <coughs> sorry, 27 wounded people, uh, including 10 children. For several years, uh, Colombia uh, blamed this attack uh, on the guerrilla, on the terrorists, uh, on the FARC. Uh, but eventually it turned out uh, that it had been the, um, the Colombian army all the way. Of course, um, also the kind of proceedings uh, that the family, the survivors tried to, to bring uh, about uh, had to go through a number of incredible obstacles, uh, legal obstacles, procedural obstacles, uh, threats, reprisals. Uh. Um, why am I telling you this story? Mm, because I think that sometimes listening to uh, what I could consider in this case um, a lesson learned uh, might also encourage and inspire you in, in continuing this uh, very important struggle for justice. That case, Santo Domingo, eventually was brought to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is the peer of the European Court of Human Rights. In 2012, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights issued its judgment, uh, uh, which is called Massacre de Santo Domingo against uh, Colombia. And in case you're interested, uh, it exists also in the English version, um, which I truly recommend you to read uh, because I think it's a very comprehensive uh, uh, reading of this kind of situations and the obligations a state should abide by uh, to, to actually comply with its international human rights obligations. Um, in that case, the court uh, made some very important findings. Uh, the court found a violation of the right to life of course, on the what the European Court of Human Rights would see as the substantive, uh, uh, the substantive nature, <clears throat> sorry, of, of the right to life, but also the procedure of one. And they considered that this was an aggravated kind of violation, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the children that were involved. Why is this important? Because uh, also in the case uh, um, of Roboski, there were several children. And when we do have children, so children involved, states would have a heightened obligation to protect uh, uh, those involved uh, com compared to, uh, to adults. The court, the Inter-American court in that case also found a violation of the prohibition of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. And this is interesting because they found it violated for those who were injured during the massacre but survived, 
but also for the relatives, because they found that living with such a sorrow, having to go through all those obstacles, also being blamed for what happened, um, was an attack on their dignity, amounting, uh, amounting at the very least to inhuman and degrading treatment. But the court also found a violation of the right to property because, of course, an aerial bombing also destroyed the properties of those who were there. This might sound trivial, but these people were left without uh, their, uh, their living sources. On top, there was a violation <coughs> of the freedom of movement because people were later on forced to displace. Um, and uh, there was also a violation of the right to privacy and dignity. And I think this is very important. Uh, finding that kind of violation recognizes uh, an aspect that, that might not be that evident in this kind of cases, uh, but it's at the core of what human rights are about. We've just celebrated the Human Rights Day. Human rights are about dignity. And these kind of events and the lack of justice uh, actually revolve around denying the dignity of some in the face of the abuse of others. What I found interesting is that the court ordered a number of measures of reparation well beyond pecuniary compensation. The first one being ordering Colombia to actually <coughs> hold the public ceremony where they acknowledge the international responsibility and they beg pardon to victims. Um, the European Court of Human Rights doesn't even dream about this, but there are other international human rights bodies uh, that do recognize this important aspect uh, of, of reparation. For instance, the Human Rights Committee is opening up to this kind of other measures of reparation, which might sound um, folklore to some, but in my view, are actually at the core of recognizing uh, the kind of violation that has been uh, that has been <clears throat> that has been perpetrated. Of course, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights also ordered Colombia to provide um, medical and psychological support to all the survivors, uh, which sounds again maybe not so much, but recognizes the kind of traumatization and the long-lasting impact uh, that these kind of events uh, have not only on survivors. Uh, but on, on, on the whole community. And as we've heard, uh, and I was very moved uh, when, when Mr. Andrew said this, uh, a village that used to be a joyful place uh, was turned into a place where they do not celebrate anymore. In my view, the very right to celebrate and the very right to continue dreaming, uh, those dreams uh, that were shattered uh, should be recognized and be at the core of any kind of future struggle for justice. I'm about to, to conclude. What I would like to say is that also at the universal level, so UN, we do have relevant standards uh, that we could refer to. Um, Racine already mentioned the general common number 36 uh, of the Human Rights Committee on the Right to Life. So with an interpretation that uh, goes very much in the direction of what I've said, not only um, certain negative obligations, but also several procedural positive obligations. Uh, but also <clears throat> we do have um, a number of, of uh, views or decisions of the Human Rights Committee, although I have to say the Human Rights Committee has not to this very day pronounced itself on a case uh, of a magnitude uh, that can be compared uh, to, 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 this, uh, to this massacre. Um, so I, I would like to end on a, if not positive, uh, realistic, uh, but proactive note. Uh, that is, we do have the tools at the international level to try to, to struggle against these kind of injustices. And from what I've heard, there is the will to continue this struggle. And I think this is key uh, precisely to write a different page for, for the future. I have to say that in my view, nothing uh, predicts future behaviors uh, uh, as much as past impunity. And we do have to try to change that. And I think this is our collective responsibility and the very fact that we are here today together is our guarantee uh, to try to write a different page for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriela. And this is actually 
very inspiring uh, and instructive. Uh, we are way over time, we're 12 minutes over time. We have one question uh, uh, to be addressed for Kerem and Ferhat in Turkish, which of course I don't fully understand. Uh, I want. I don't know if it's possible to address it relatively quickly, Karen. Maybe in one minute. I don't know. Is it possible? Or uh, I think there are two questions. One two to questions. Ferhat, then, then to me. Uh, okay. Maybe Ferhat might. Maybe start. Ferhat first. Sorry, and my Turkish is inexistent. So <laughs> Ferhat, I can let you. Maybe Karen, you want to. Yeah. Uh, Ferhat, that. Soruyor. Mm -hmm. um, the following question. I share your grief on this 10th anniversary after the um, refusal of the European Court of Human Rights to look into this case. You said to the bar associations that you had asked constantly that a, commi and a commission among the bar associations be formed and why did they had not done this? Uh, have you received an answer to this? Are you satisfied? Shall I answer that question? Yes, you should, says Kerem. Unfortunately, after having missed the essence, uh, the whole of the whole affair, and when things turned to the secondary aspects, uh, there was a great debate. This is what the Droboski is like. There is a um, undeniable truth lying out there, and all the institutions and uh, uh, authorities of the state refuse this. And not only that, but the European Court of Human Rights, which uh, really poses as the main defender of the uh, right to life, uh, hands down a decision that supports Turkey. And on top of that, the lawyers perhaps turned in a, kind, a certain document a bit too late. If a, a lawyer may not have executed his uh, or her duty uh, in the correct way, this was not true. Because we were not really uh, struggling with the essence of the case. The, the secondary aspects became something big that we started to debate. This is a kind of dead end. And The, the question was how to shed light on the whole question. Of course, while uh, waging this legal struggle, there was the following conviction. It's not only this or that person against whom the massacre was committed. It was really against the Kurdish people on the basis of their ethnic um, roots. With respect to the solution to the Kurdish question, uh, to see to it that these massacres do not recur in the future. There is a democratic political movement that wages a struggle. And in at that time as well, there were people who wanted to uh, take this to the Turkish parliament and struggle there. And there was this political party, uh, the predecessor of the HDP that waged a struggle in parliament. And this uh, political party had a uh, um, legal commission who followed the case most closely. We also had demands. Because the people weren't living there, weren't equipped sufficiently in the legal domain, uh, 
we had to take up their case. And this is a community that has faced such violation of law. So we searched new ways and people, Uh, the, the, sorry, the political party uh, that was interested in this case made demands. Some of these were met, but in the end, we cannot ask the following question, for instance. Why did the European Court of Human Rights act this way when there is such a blatant violation of the right to life? Is it a matter of technical procedures that they take refuge in? Why did the Constitutional Court, well, there were certain stamps missing or there were certain proxy documents that were missing? Okay, but what happens to the other 32 uh, applicants? Why were their cases were not uh, discussed? Because those 32 had already submitted the necessary documents in time. So this question was not asked. And well, the uh, documents came two days late and that was what was discussed, not the 32 other applicants whose cases were not looked into by the Constitutional Court. So. This probably derives from our weaknesses. In a system, in a conception that is so anti-democratic, disregards all rights, uh, steps on all legal guarantees, vis-a-vis -vis that kind of system. What kind of shortcomings did we have? We perhaps should judge ourselves as well. Of course, I know the sentiment. We had criticisms ourselves. And personally, I would say that the self-criticism was um, given over and over again with this, within the party. This is all I have to say. Thank you. There is a second question, uh, uh, Karen, but if you T in one minute, because really we are way over time and actually the public is very uh, patient. Kudre asks uh, whether the inclusion of the general of staff uh, and uh, the prime minister uh, in the indictment might be a new thing and uh, is it ordinary? Uh, or not, uh, she asks. Uh, this is, uh, yes, I mean, uh, there is a very quick story about uh, the incident uh, in the indictment. And uh, we learn from that, that the, the highest level of uh, military official in Turkey uh, was informed, but uh, he was not questioned, neither the prime minister and their role and responsibility in the case uh, was not a question in the indictment. But of course, uh, this might be uh, one of the reasons for uh, decision, decision of non-prosecution. Because if you initiate a prosecution uh, in which uh, the highest uh, military officer in the country uh, is included, then at one point you need to uh, question that person or other uh, politicians who might be responsible uh, for the uh, incident because it was a cross-border operation and it might not be taken by a, a low level uh, military personnel uh, close to, uh, to the village. Uh, that, that's important, yes, that's important, uh, but it doesn't mean that they were really questioned and um, there was a chance to hold them accountable uh, for, for the event. Uh, but uh, as you stated, it might be seen as an exception 
um, about the investigations carried out uh, about uh, massacres in, in Turkey. Thank you very much, Kerem. Uh, uh, and thank you very much to all the speaker, Roshan uh, Pile, Gabriela Citroni, Kerem Altiparmak. Uh, you will not get offended if I think, in particular, Mr. Ferra Tenko, and, uh, and again, this is all our condolences and, uh, and also all our wishes uh, uh, and uh, partaking of this feeling of struggle. In a sense, uh, I think if I get on with uh, something from this meeting and apart from the discussions we had is we need to do something so that 10 years on, we don't get another celebration where nothing has happened, where no accountability has happened, when uh, we are still there struggling. And uh, I think as SCG, we're gonna try what we can. And as I think we don't want this uh, uh, massacre to die in silence because that's going to be a second death or third death and uh, that i think is unforgivable and it's unforgivable to the victims their memory to the family members to this village that used to have parties and now cannot live anymore but this is also a profound injustice for uh, society as well for the uh, the fact that when as Gabriela was saying very clearly, and I think as Ferret made feel, and says, when there is impunity, this is a risk for everyone. It means things can happen again. This is an insecurity for everyone. Impunity for serious human rights violation is not only about history, it's about our present, it's about our future. And I think that's why it's very important that we don't just let things down, we don't give up on the struggle, even if there are tons of reasons just to give up and to be tired. And that's the reason why I want to really say thank you. Thank you to uh, Ferra thank, thank you to all the villagers. Thank you for all those who continue to struggle. Thank you, Karen, of course, uh, with this case, because this is for you, of course, but it's not only for you, I think it's for, for all of us. And uh, we're gonna be there. We're gonna continue to struggle and thank you for sharing this with us. And uh, to the next one, we hopefully will better news.